वेलकम टू माई लेक्चर सीरीज ऑन न्यूरल नेटवर्क एंड डीप लर्निंग इन दिस लेक्चर वी विल प्रोवाइड एन इंट्रोडक्शन टू न्यूरल नेटवर्क एंड ओवर व्यू ऑफ द इंस्पिरेशन बिहाइंड न्यूरल नेटवर्क एज वेल एज एन ओवर व्यू ऑफ द हिस्ट्री ऑफ न्यूरल नेटवर्क वी विल ऑल्सो कवर द अप्स एंड डाउन इन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ न्यूरल नेटवर्क द फील्ड ऑफ न्यूरल नेटवर्क एंड डीप लर्निंग इज मोर देन हाफ अ सेंचुरी ओल्ड however it is only in this current decade that neural networks have seen an explosion in popularity one of the reasons for this is that neural networks has seen victories in very in eye catching competitions like imagenet which have brought them fame the potential of neural networks is now being realized because of fundamental shifts in hardware paradigms and data availability the new term deep learning has been coined and it signifies a rebirth in the field of neural networks the term deep learning also emphasizes a specific aspect of neural networks which has to be which has to do with the fact that it is often used in the form of deep computational graphs so these videos are based on my recent book on neural networks and deep learning the videos are not meant to be exhaustive with respect to the book however they will provide a firm grounding of the important aspects of neural network which one can build around so they provide the initial background to study more details on the book i have also made the slides of these lectures available for download together with their latex source in case you want to use them for teaching so this book covers both the old and the new in neural networks so the core learning methods techniques like back propagation traditional architectures and specialized architectures are covered among specialized architectures we cover architectures which work in specialized data domains like image data or speech data examples include convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks in addition we also cover the latest methods like variational auto encoders generative adversarial networks neural turing machines attention mechanisms and reinforcement learning now reinforcement learning is a field separate from neural networks but is closely related to deep learning because it is often integrated with deep learning methods so reinforcement learning will be presented from the perspective of deep learning applications in addition to these modern architectures we also cover some of the forgotten architectures which are not used so frequently anymore these include radial basis functions and coherent self organizing maps the reason that we have covered these is because even though they are not used so frequently anymore they are still quite useful in many settings so there are two views two predominant views of neural networks The way neural networks started was as a way to simulate the biological learning by simulating the nervous system in biological organisms. However, the modern view of neural networks is, is that it is viewed as a way to increase the power of known models in machine learning by stacking them in careful ways as computational graphs. So the number of nodes in the computational graph controls the learning capacity with increasing data. and the specific architecture of the computational graph incorporates domain specific insights so for example in images they have a very specific type of structure so by using a specific type of architecture like convolutional neural networks you can do better with image data so the architecture of the computational graph has the ability to incorporate knowledge about the domain at hand now many of these computational graphs are very deep because they have many layers and the success of such deep computational graphs has led to the coining of the term deep learning in the past decade so the first model of a computational unit was the perceptron which was proposed in 1958 it was roughly inspired by the biological model of a neuron and it was actually implemented not using software code the way we do it today but it was implemented using a very large piece of hardware so this uh, architecture this first architecture generated great excitement but it failed to live up to its inflated expectations one of the problems was that uh, during the early years when it was first proposed uh, some statements were made to the new york times to the effect that they had the embryo of a machine which would talk walk reproduce uh, 
uh, right. Uh, statements like these were made to the New York Times, but of course, we don't have anything close to that even today. In fact, the perceptron, as we'll see today, as, as we'll see in later lectures, is not any more powerful than a simple linear model that can be implemented in a few lines of code today. But at that time, it was a big deal. In fact, to implement the perceptron, they used a large piece of hardware. In fact, this piece of hardware uh, is in cold storage at the, at the Smithsonian Institute. And in fact, uh, I am providing this photo here of the perceptron, uh, courtesy of the Smithsonian Institute. After the initial euphoria on neural networks, uh, it was realized that the perceptron only had limited expressive pow power. And uh, one of the very significant books at that time was a book in 1969 written by Minsky and Papert. This book was called Perceptrons. And uh, it was very pessimistic on neural networks in general. The point that this book really made was that the perceptrons only had limited expressive power and it was essential to put together multiple computational units. The other point is that the book also provided a pessimistic outlook on training multilayer networks. So basically what they said was that nobody knew how to train multilayer neural networks anyway, and it was unlikely that anybody would ever figure out how to do it. So Minsky and Paper's book led to the first winter in the field of neural networks. And Minsky was a very influential field in neural networks. And being the first author of the book, he's often fairly or unfairly, he's often blamed for setting back the field by a few years. So one question that arises is whether Minsky and Paper were justified in their pessimism on the field. So the question is, did we really not know how to train multiple units at the time Minsky and Paper's book came out? Well, the answer depends on who you ask. AI researchers truly didn't know. In fact, they didn't believe that it was even possible to do it. However, Training computational graphs with dynamic programming had already been done in control theory in the 1960s. In fact, the backpropagation algorithm that we know today is nothing but a simple application of dynamic programming. So in 1974, Paul Verbos, in his PhD thesis, he proposed how to do backpropagation in the context of neural networks. However, the bias against uh, neural networks had been so firmly entrenched at the time that he was promptly ignored. And in fact, he did not form formally publish his paper until 1982. Now, the interesting point is that Verbos did uh, try to make an attempt to convince prominent researchers at the time uh, that backpropagation was a way in order to train multilayer neural networks. But at that time, it was even considered a heresy to even believe that this was possible. So even though he spoke to several people, several prominent people, including Minsky, that uh, to publish a paper on backpropagation, none of them was interested. Simply speaking, nobody was even willing to risk their academic reputation to publish a paper on backpropagation. So this is this was generally consistent with a general view of artificial intelligence in the 70s and the 80s. This was the era of work on logic and reasoning, that's discrete mathematics, which was viewed as the panacea of AI. And this view had influential pros proponents in artificial intelligence, people like Patrick Henry Winston. And the work on continuous optimization, work on probability had very few believers. The researchers that we know today in neural networks, well-known researchers like Hinton, they were certainly not considered mainstream researchers at the time. Now, this view, of course, as we know, has been completely reversed today. And the early favorites in logic and reasoning, they have little to show in spite of all, eff all the effort that has been put in the field. Now, now backpropagation had a second coming in 1986 where Rumelhart, Hinton and Williams wrote two very influential papers on backpropagation in 1986. This was of course independent from the prior work because Paul Verbos' work in 1974 had been forgotten and buried at the time. Uh, 
and one aspect of rumal hart's papers is that they are actually presented very beautifully and these papers partially because of the way they were presented they were able to at least partially resurrect the field so uh, acceptance of back propagation encouraged more research in the field of multilayer networks so in the 90s there was sporadic research in the field of neural networks and by the year 2000 most of the modern architectures that we know today such as convolutional neural networks recurrent neural networks even long short term memory they had already been set up in some form however these methods they really didn't work very well so the winter of neural networks it continued after a brief period of excitement this was a different era it was the era of the support vector machine and the new view in the machine learning community was that the svm was the panacea at least for supervised learning now of course this view is of course somewhat ironic because as we'll see in later lectures that an svm at least a linear svm is very very similar to a perceptron in fact the loss function of an svm is different from that of the perceptron in only a minor way of course the svm was used in the context of kernel methods but kernel methods are independent from the svm model itself kernel methods are simply a way of performing unsupervised feature engineering which you can combine with almost any method including the perceptron so the question arises what changed what made modern neural networks so popular as they are today so the main difference today is that we have lots of data and lots of computational power and it is possible to train large and deep networks with millions of neurons so the almost the same architectures that were proposed in the year 2000 with a few optimi optimization tweaks and with increased size uh, when they are trained today they have achieved crushing victories in deep learning competitions such as imagenet so this has led to a lot of anticipatory excitement that the data availability and computational power will only continue to grow so the question is that in a few years when we are able to train neural networks with as many computational units as a human brain what is going to happen so your guess is as good as mine about what happens the answer to that is we don't really know what will happen then now uh, deep learning has now assumed the mantle of the ai panacea of course we have heard this story before and the question is why should it be different this time now deep learning certainly can do many things that traditional machine learning cannot do especially if your data is richly structured so for example image data speech data in those cases you can show that deep learning can do things that traditional machine learning cannot do but this doesn't mean that deep learning will win in every case there are indeed settings in which you are better off by using a conventional machine learning technique like a random forest so neural networks were originally designed to simulate the learning process in biological organisms so the human nervous system contains cells called neurons and the neurons are connected to one another with the use of synapses the strengths of synaptic connections often change in response to external stimuli this change is what causes learning in living organisms this is the primary biological inspiration on the basis of which neural networks were designed so it, just as in biological neural networks you have neurons artificial neural networks contain computational new, new units which are referred to as neurons and again just as biological neural networks are connected with the use of weighted synapses the computational units in artificial neural networks are also connected to one another with the use of weights and the strengths of weights they change uh, even in artificial neural net networks which is how learning occurs in these networks so each input to a computational unit is scaled with a weight which affects the function that is computed at that unit now in living organism synaptic weights change in response to external stimuli 
So for example, if an organism has an unpleasant experience, that will change the synaptic weights in the neurons of that organism. And that will train the organism to behave differently. This is how learning occurs in, bio in, bio in the biological case. In artificial neural networks, the weights are of course learned with the use of training data, which are viewed as input-output pairs. Almost all neural networks, with a small number of exceptions, work with the use of input-output pairs. So an example is, for example, if you have an image with a label such as a banana, now if your neural network classifies it differently, then the weights of the neural network will change in response to the error made in predicting the label of the image. You can view that error as the unpleasant stimulus received by the neural network. So when trained over many images, the network learns how to classify the image correctly. Now, this biological paradigm is often criticized as a very inexact caricature because the functions computed uh, in a neural network, they are gross oversimplifications of what really happens in the brain. In fact, no one exactly knows how the brain truly works. In spite of this fact, there are several examples where the principles of neuroscience have been successfully applied in designing neural networks. A classical example of this is convolutional neural networks which are used for classifying image data. And the convolutional neural network is based on architectural principles drawn from the cat's visual cortex. As we now know, convolutional neural networks can now achieve an accuracy for image recognition which exceeds that of a human. So there has been a recent focus in recent years on leveraging the principles of neuroscience in neural network design. So even though the, it is true that the, new, that the biological inspiration is a caricature, this view is not fully justified either. Now, an alternative view of neural networks is to view them as, comput as computational graph extensions of traditional machine learning. In fact, as you will see in later lectures, the elementary units that compute in the computational graph and neural network, they compute very similar functions to traditional machine learning models like linear or logistic regression. In fact, much of what you know about traditional machine learning, models like linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machines, they can be recast as shallow neural models. And in the upcoming lectures, we will show specific examples. But the main problem is that when large amounts of data are available, these models are unable to learn all the structure. Neural networks provide a way to increase the capacity of these models by connecting multiple units as computational graphs. And by connecting the units in particular ways, so for example, we discussed the case of convolutional unit networks which are based on inspiration from the cat's visual cortex. One can incorporate domain-specific insights. Now, uh, one can view neural networks and machine uh, and many conventional machine learning methods within the same frameworks. For smaller data sets, traditional machine learning methods often provide slightly better performance. The reason for this is that traditional models often they provide more choices, they provide interpretable insights and ways to handcraft features. However, they reach their capacity early. So if you have a lot of data, you are better off with using deep learning methods. So if your data, for example, has a lot of structure, then in those cases, deep learning methods are the techniques of choice. So the recent success of neural networks has largely been caused by an increase in data and computational power. So one issue, of course, is that increased computational power has also reduced the cycle times for experimentation. So, for example, if it requires you a month to train a neural network, you cannot try more than 12 variations in a year on a single platform. So this kind of problem often held back algorithmic advances in neural networks. So reduced cycle times in recent years have also led to a larger number of successful tweaks of neural networks. And many of the models that we use today, which are so successful, they have not changed dramatically from an era where neural networks were seen as impractical. It is just that we have been able to tweak them in such a way that they are, we are now able to train much larger networks on current platforms.
we are now operating in a data and computational regime where deep learning has become attractive compared to traditional machine learning. 